All right, so I got some absolutely wild clips here for you guys, both from Democrats and from Republicans, as well as from Alan Dershowitz's, I guess if you want to call him that, on the current state of the endless Israeli bombardment in the Gaza Strip. So I first want to get to some quick casualty updates here for you guys. I'm just going to be doing this at the top of every video I do on this topic, just to update you guys on the, the death toll and the carnage that we are currently seeing unfold on the ground right now. Uh, so before we get to this first Brian Mass clip, which is probably one of the most insane clips I've ever seen in my entire life from a U.S. politician. Uh, again, here from the uh, Euromed Human Rights Monitor, they say that roughly 9,400 have been killed so far in this bombardment, and if you get into more of the minutiae here, 3,900 of those have been children, 2,200 have been women, and 8,400 have been civilians. So out of 9,400 who have been killed, 8,400 of those have been civilians. So roughly we're dealing with like an 8 to 1 kill ratio here from the Israeli government of civilian to Hamas. Okay, just to give you a perspective, right, this is the country, the military, that we are supposed to believe, according to the Biden administration, is doing everything that they possibly can to avoid civilian casualties, right? An 8 to 1 ratio so far on civilians to potential combatants. We also have a further 2,200 that are currently under the rubble, as far as we know, and that gives you another indication in terms of how this number over here is probably an underestimate, which is something we also saw confirmed by multiple UN officials. We have roughly 25,000 injuries that have been reported so far, 1.5 million people, 1.5 million people have been displaced. They say that 45,000 almost uh, uh, homes have been completely destroyed and almost 144,000 have been partially destroyed. So I, I showed you guys the statistics from the UN just like a week ago at this point. So this is probably outdated. It's probably an undercount. But we saw the estimate of like 42% of the housing in the Gaza Strip has been destroyed. 42%. So at this point, it could be a majority of the housing here. But I mean, we're dealing with, with you know, almost 200,000 structures that have been either completely or partially destroyed. These are people's homes. This is where people live in the Gaza Strip, the world's largest open air prison, completely destroyed. I mean, how, how are we supposed to go forward from here after this? this? This kind of indiscriminate bombing of the entirety of the Gaza Strip. I mean, like, Jesus Christ, look at these numbers. 90 destroyed or damaged press headquarters, 182 damaged schools, 581 damaged industrial facilities, 56 damaged mosques, and three damaged churches, 254 targeted health staff, and 108 targeted health facilities, as well as 34 murdered journalists. Okay, so that's your latest numbers for you. Now, let's go ahead and check in with this absolutely psychopathic motherfucker, Brian Mast from the state of Florida, on what he thinks of these innocent civilians that are currently being massacred. <laughs> as a whole, I would encourage the other side to not so lightly throw around the idea of innocent Palestinian civilians, as is frequently said. Uh, I don't think we would so lightly throw around the term innocent Nazi civilians during World War II. Okay, so we got sort of like a double whammy there, right? We have him saying basically there is no such thing as an innocent Palestinian civilian. That's the implication of what he's saying, if not him directly saying it. And then we have a comparison to the Nazis, right? I mean, obviously not the first time that we've seen this kind of comparison made. I've seen U.S. politicians, Israeli politicians, European politicians all make the same kind of an argument that the Palestinian people are basically the new Nazis or something like that, which is obviously completely ridiculous. Number one, because uh, their, their ideologies don't line up in virtually any way, shape, and form. Number two, because we're, when we're talking about the Palestinian people, we're talking about some of the most oppressed people on the planet. We're not talking about an organized and, and powerful military and state apparatus that is trying to, in a, in a cohesive way, exterminate the Jewish people. We're talking about people in Gaza, specifically, who have been kept in a, a, an open-air prison for decades, okay? People who have no access to reliable food, water, internet, uh, supplies for anything, okay, who are currently being b bombed into oblivion. And this is who he says are the new Nazis, apparently. All right, so there's Republican uh, Representative Brian Mast from Florida. But, you know, as, as insane as that is, and as bloodthirsty as that is, and sort of him giving the green light for Israel to go in and massacre these people by saying there are no innocent civilians, right? Same thing we heard from uh, uh, Herzog, the uh, uh, Israeli president, right, at the beginning of this campaign, saying we're fighting human animals, you know, that the Palestinians elected Hamas, they're responsible for Hamas, and so there is no such thing as an innocent civilian. You know, similar to that, we've also gotten similar things from Democrats as well. 
So I want to watch this first before we get to that Barry Weiss tweet there. So here we have from Ryan Grimm, Karine Jean-Pierre, the White House spokesperson, being asked about anti-Israel protests that have been taking place. And let's just look at how she responds to this. Doesn't Biden think the anti-Israel protesters in this country are extremists? What I can say is what we've been very clear about this. When it comes to anti-Semitism, there is no place. We have to make sure that we speak against it very loud. Uh, and be uh, and be very clear about that. Remember, what the president decided to, when the president decided to run for president, is what he saw in Charlottesville in 2017, when we he saw uh, neo Nazis marching down the streets of Charlottesville uh, with vile anti-Semitic uh, just hatred, and he was very clear then, and he's very clear now. Uh okay, so there we have an official spokesperson, the spokesperson for the Joe Biden administration, comparing what the what the Fox reporter said there was anti-Israel protests, right? So people who are protesting either for Palestinian liberation and Palestinian human rights or against the state, the government of Israel, not against Jewish people. That was not the question. The question was anti-Israel protests, right? So those could be people who are against Israeli apartheid or the ethnic cleansing of the Palestinian people or the current bombing campaign in the Gaza Strip where they're committing war crimes left and right. Those are the kinds of people we're talking about who have gone out protesting, including myself, right? I've been to some of these protests. I'm going to another one this weekend here in Washington, D.C., near the White House, okay? And she's comparing protesters like me and, and others who believe in the Palestinian cause and who are against apartheid and ethnic cleansing, she is comparing us to neo-Nazis. Actual, full-throated, like, the Jews will not replace us, as they chanted at Charlottesville. That's who they're comparing us to. Neo-Nazis. This is the Democratic Party here. This isn't the Republican Party. This is the Democratic Party. So now we have Republicans like Brian Mast, as well as many others, and now Democrats like the fucking president himself, who are equating criticisms of the government of Israel, which is, believe it or not, very worthy of criticism, with Nazism, okay, with being anti-Semitic. I mean, that was the first thing that she said. The question was, what does the president think about the anti-Israel protests? And she immediately said, we will not stand for anti-Semitism, and those people are basically the same as neo-Nazis who marched in Charlottesville. I mean, what do we even say at this point? What do we even say at this point? I mean, I've used this example so many times before, but would Karine Jean-Pierre, would the Biden administration or would Republican Brian Mast, would he say that you are a, a rabid Islamophobe if you criticize the governments of Iran or of Saudi Arabia? Would he say you're Islamophobic if you do that? Or, or you're against Christianity if you criticize the United States because we're a predominantly Christian country? I mean, it's just such a, a farcical argument at face value here, but it's being repeated by the, the most powerful people in the world. And just as, just as a reminder here, this was a good point that was made in this article by Ryan Grimm, um, who's been doing great reporting, by the way, over on, on Breaking Points uh, during the entirety of this, this bombing in Gaza. And he points out here that before joining the White House, Karine Jean-Pierre slammed Netanyahu for alleged war crimes against Gazans. So, I don't know. I mean, you guys tell me, is this something that's deeply baked within the ideological framework? of Karine Jean-Pierre, or is she just a complete hollow sellout who has nothing to her core, who is so deeply amoral or immoral and soulless that she is willing to go out there and, and say what she says there, comparing people who are protesting against apartheid and ethnic cleansing to Nazis? Because, I mean, look at the, look at the comparison here. Previously, before she was a mouthpiece for the Biden administration, she's critical of Netanyahu and says that he's essentially a war criminal committing war crimes in Gaza, specifically. And then now that she's a mouthpiece for the Biden administration, completely different thing, right? Now it's the people who are protesting against the war criminal Netanyahu, that you called a war criminal, for his crimes in Gaza. Now it's those people who are, I guess, the criminals in this situation. I mean, you guys tell me, which one is it? Is she just deeply soulless and has no standards of morality? Is she just you know, a sellout who doesn't care about this shit, or is it ideological? I don't know. But now we move on to this which I thought was really funny, from Barry Weiss. Uh, why do young Americans support Hamas? <laughs> Look at TikTok. In the FP, Representative Mike Gallagher argues that uh, the app, TikTok, is a is digital <laughs> fentanyl, okay? I love that phrase. Digital fentanyl made by China. <laughs> and it is brainwashing our youth against the country and our allies, okay? So look at the lack of an ability to look inwards 
to be critical of your own government or your government's allies. I mean, we're, we're allied with, with Saudi Arabia. Would these people say the same thing if people were criticizing the government of Saudi Arabia for like, you know, having journalists dismembered like Jamal Khashoggi? Okay, or, or you know, persecuting minorities or, uh, you know, people of, of different faiths within the Saudi Arabian uh, government. Would they be, you know, say the same thing about that kind of thing if you're critical of Saudi Arabia or Iran for that matter or any other country on the face of the planet for Russia? I mean, I mean think about this. Why do young Americans support Hamas? Look at TikTok. So what she's referring to here is the fact that we've seen on TikTok. If you go and you just do like a simple comparison of like the hashtags, right? Hashtag stand for Israel, hashtag stand for Palestine or stand for Gaza. The Palestinians are blowing them out of the water, right? It's, it's a far more popular thing on TikTok. I would argue that maybe that has something to do with the algorithm, sure. But maybe that also has to do with the fact that, I don't know, young people aren't just sitting around and watching CNN and Fox News all day. Maybe we actually have alternative sources of information that we can look to to get information on what's going on on the ground and hear directly from Palestinian sources to, to get an understanding of their plight. Maybe we're, you know, because we're not just looking at everything, everything through the filter of, of a corporate media mouthpiece that we can have a different perspective on these things. Maybe that's why people support Palestinian liberation, which by the way is what young people support. Young Americans don't support Hamas. They're just against the crimes of Israel. Okay. And support Palestinians being liberated. That's, that's a massive difference there right? But no, it must just be this digital fentanyl made by China, right? We can't be, we can't be independent. We can't have our own thoughts, right? We can't have a differing opinion from the U.S. State Department or else we, it must be brainwashing, right? It, it can't be that the U.S. government is doing anything wrong or that any of our various allies, allies around the world are doing anything wrong. No, it must be that young people are being propagandized. I mean, this is how, this is how a country collapses, in the long run. And it's kind of funny to see because like, you know, you could say the same thing about polls that show that, you know, young Americans are turning against capitalism. I mean, it's the same kind of concept, right? Socialism in, in some polls has a higher approval rating than capitalism. And you could look at that and you could basically do a lazy analysis like Barry Weiss is doing here and say, oh, well, that must be because of like the woke mind virus or something like that. That's, that's tricking these young people uh, against capitalism. Or you could do an honest analysis of it and you could say, well, maybe it's the fact that, I don't know, young people are saddled with student debt and that jobs aren't paying them a living wage and that rent is absolutely skyrocketing and through the roof and they have no prospect of ever owning a home and living the so-called American dream. That, uh, you know, we live in a country where literally less than a handful of billionaires have more wealth than the bottom half of the country, you know, that we can't afford health care and basic life necessities. I mean, maybe that could have something to do with, uh, you know, young Americans turning against capitalism. No, no, no. It must be the Chinese digital fentanyl woke mind virus or something like that. This is what their perspective is. And again, we also had the Dersh man himself. Uh, basically saying the same thing that we heard there, or a similar thing that we heard there from Karine Jean-Pierre and Brian Mass. Let's hear what the Dersh man has to say about all of this. Citizens of Gaza, these innocent civilians who so many people are shedding tears about, they voted for Hamas in the last election, and they would probably vote for Hamas today. So yeah, they're non-combatants, they're civilians, but they're supporters of Hamas. Whereas the people who were killed in, in Israel, many of them were not supporters of Netanyahu. Many of them represented kind of left wing kibbutzniks, peace activists, people who are opposed to the Netanyahu government. People okay, so let's just, let's think about this logic here for a second. First off, just, just to, to lay the facts out there for everybody. Um, I've seen estimates on this, right? Keep in mind, half the population of Gaza are children. They're children. So that takes a huge chunk out of that population that was even alive during the last election or was old enough to vote in the election where Hamas was elected back in like 05, 06, right? So I've seen estimates that say that as little as 7%, 7% of the current population of Gaza actually potentially voted for Hamas in that 2006 election. And he's saying, now that we're in 2023, the entirety of the population is responsible for the recent October 7th attack into Israel because back in 06, the population in Gaza voted for Hamas to represent them. I mean, let's just think about this logic. Even if I was to accept him and to say, okay, if there was another election that was held today, maybe the people of Gaza would vote for Hamas. Okay, let's let's take that to its logical extent. So are we now saying that anybody who votes for a government that commits war crimes or, or commits an atrocity in another country, that they then get to be bombed into oblivion and, and have, you know, missile, missiles dropped on themselves and their family because they voted for that government? So then are we saying that anybody who voted for George W. Bush 
who then went into Iraq and Afghanistan and killed upwards of a million innocent people, that now it's it's logical that Iraqis and people born in Afghanistan should get to come to the United States and drop bombs on anybody who voted for George W. Bush? Is that what we're saying? Or any Libyans can come to the United States and bomb the houses of anybody who voted for Obama? Is that what we're saying now? Or, or even take it out at even more uh, close scale there. Are we now saying that Palestinians, civilians, who have been bombed by the Israeli government, then have a right to go in and bomb Israeli civilians? Because a lot of them voted for Netanyahu. A lot of them put this government apparatus in place that killed them throughout the last number of decades. I mean, that's the logic. It's just an endless cycle of violence. They see no hypocrisy in this. It just goes one way. It just goes one way, always, right? So there's Alan Dershowitz for you. Completely insane. We also had a couple other things that I wanted to point out here before I just end this video. Here from AJ Plus, this was an interesting thing. So we had um, one of the uh, commissioners for the United Nations in, in, in the New York office there, the High Commissioner for Human Rights. He resigned over all of this, over what he called a genocide in Gaza. And so I wanted to read a couple of excerpts from his uh, resignation letter here. He said, This is a textbook case of genocide. The European ethno-nationalist settler colonial project in Palestine has entered its final phase toward the expedited destruction of the last remnants of the indigenous Palestinian life in Palestine. What's more, the governments of the United States, the United Kingdom, and much of Europe who are wholly complicit in the horrific assault. In the immediate term, we must work for an immediate ceasefire and an end to the long-standing siege on Gaza, stand up against the ethnic cleansing of Gaza, Jerusalem, and the West Bank, and elsewhere, document the genocidal assault on Gaza, help bring massive humanitarian aid and reconstruction to the Palestinians, and fight like hell for a principled approach in the UN political offices. So that's what the UN New York High Commissioner for Human Rights had to say about all of this. And I think that he's 100% correct and, you know, honestly, credit to him for resigning and, and trying to make this point as much as he possibly could. And I'll finish off here with uh, another more, you know, another example of, of genocidal language that we have seen from current or former, you know, high, high level uh, members of the Israeli government. So here we have the former uh, Israeli public diplomacy minister. This is the former public diplomacy minister who is still right now, as they point out here down in the uh, the reader's notes. Okay, she resigned recently on October 13th, but she still remains a member of the Knesset for the Likud party, Benjamin Netanyahu's coalition, right? She said, quote, erase all of Gaza from the face of the earth, that the Gazan monsters will fly to the southern fence with Egypt and try to enter, enter Egyptian territory, or they will die and their death will be evil, Gaza should be erased. Still questioning the genocidal intent. And I think that that's a, that's a fair question there. And I think that what the UN High Commissioner in New York pointed out there at the end was 100% correct. And meanwhile, again, we have US representatives um, from, from the farthest right wing of the Republican Party to, I, I don't wanna say the farthest left wing, but the vast majority of the Democratic Party who are basically fully in lockstep behind Israel. I mean, the most that you can possibly ask from these motherfuckers, outside of like a handful of squad members who are actually standing up and calling for a ceasefire, the most that you can ask for from a, a broad majority of the Democratic Party is a so-called like humanitarian pause, which is just like this completely made up sort of rhetoric that they pulled out of their asses or, or took from one of these meetings at the DNC, you know, a coalition, you know, meetings that they have or whatever, right? And just sort of like made up this term, humanitarian pause, as if like the problem is that we need to have a pause in the bombing so that we can get a couple of trucks in to give aid to the people who are currently being bombed and then just resume the bombing afterwards, right? As if that's the solution to what is going on right now. I mean, it's like offering a band-aid to somebody who you just shot seven times, right? And then you're saying, also, after I give you this Band-Aid, I'm going to continue buying bullets and shooting you with them. I mean, that's that's kind of what the United States position is at this point. So, I mean, there you go. It doesn't seem like there's there's that much of a light between Democrats and Republicans on this issue. Um, it seems like at this point, all we're left to do is try to, uh, you know, stand up in, in whatever way that we possibly can. Again, I'm going to be going to one of these protests at the White House this weekend. Uh, I hope that there's a lot of people there here in D.C. Um, and, you know, just keep trying to put pressure on people. You know, I mean, keep trying to put pressure on your representatives, make your voice heard, you know, stand up. It's a difficult issue. I know that a lot of people aren't as lucky as me as to, you know, be in a position where I can use my voice and, and kind of 
just sort of like say whatever I want without having to, you know, have the threat of losing my job or something like that. But I mean, this is just one of those moments where, you know, 10 years from now, I hope, or 20 years from now, or whatever the case may be, people are going to look back at this moment. And, uh, you know, I, I hope recognize the genocidal monstrosity that we are currently witnessing right now and maybe even have some sort of self-reflection and be like damn i was on the wrong side of history there right as all of these innocent civilians were being massacred in front of my eyes and i was giving every justification under the book to allow it to happen and um so you know i mean again I'll, I'll link the resources down below as i have been in some of my recent videos of the ceasefire today uh, resources that were put together by Jordan Ewell. Um, so it tells you, you know, what to say to your member of Congress if you want to call them. It gives you the resources to do that. Tells you what protests are near you. Tells you petitions to sign and all of that good stuff. Or if you, if you want to make donations to the Palestinian people, it also has that on it. So I'll link that down below. But, um, you know, at this point, it seems like all we can do, unfortunately, is uh, kind of sit back and watch and just try to apply whatever pressure we can to to end this absolute brutality. Everyone is saying good politic guy has the best politic. Believe me, no one does it like him. Believe me, everyone is saying things.